Let's go ahead and get started. Um, once again, welcome everybody to a webinar, how CRI Docker D standardizes container workflows on Kubernetes. Uh, my name is Kevin Ng. I will be your host and presenter for today. So a little bit about me. Uh, once again, my name is Kevin Ng and I am a senior solutions architect in the Mirantis pre-sales team. And I've been with the company for just under two years and my role really is to work with folks to understand their use case and guide them on a path to achieve business value. So. What are we going to be covering today? What we're going to do is really talk a little bit about the history of the Docker engine and Kubernetes, exactly what CRI Docker D is and how it fits into the architecture of a Kubernetes cluster, and really the benefits of standardizing your developed container workflows across environments, utilizing the Docker Mantis container runtime and also CRI Docker D. So if we think back or look back uh, a couple years um, prior and into the history of the whole containerization, popularization, popularization of containerization, I should say, right? Just try to say that three times really quickly. In 2013, um, Docker Engine was released and Docker was formed. Right? So this really became um, one of the it, well, containerization kind of existed before then, but this kind of brought it into the mainstream and, and made it um, a lot simpler for folks to be able to um, work with containerization. And there's a lot of tooling that are built around containerization um, for folks to work with. In 2015, uh, version one of Kubernetes was released and that utilizes Docker as main container runtime. Now, in version 1.5, the container runtime interface was introduced to provide the capability to interact with the wider range of container runtimes. Prior to that, Docker was pretty heavily ingrained within the Kubernetes environment. So as a result of the container runtime interface, uh, Docker Shim was created as an adapter between the container runtime interface, the so CRI, and the Docker engine. And we'll talk a little bit more about the details of that in, in the following uh, slides there. Okay. Um, I mean, if you think about this, though, <clears throat> the Kubernetes systems really needed the Docker runtime as an engine block for containers, if you think of it as a car analogy. So really, it just needed the engine. The, the Docker was essentially an entire car. So while some Kubernetes admins wanted to use the entire car, there are others that want a slimmed down version uh, with fewer moving parts. So really just the engine to run their containers. So the Docker community started working to spin out container D, which became life as a runtime manager for the run C component, which is at the heart of the Docker engine. So in other words, the engine block itself. So in 2016 then, the container D was then integrated back into Docker. Now, a few years back in, in well, really literally um, uh, quite recently, in version 1.2, the Docker support uh, in the kubelet has been depreciated, and the Docker shim support, I should say, and it will be removed in, as announced in a future release. At that time, it was originally announced to be 1.22, which was then pushed further down the line. So the kubelet uses a module called Docker shim, like I said, that implements the CRI support for Docker. Right? So that has been depreciated, even though it's still within the Kubernetes environment. Now, so in between the whole Docker shim support then um, was then taken out and then uh, Mirantis along with a number of open source um, uh, maintainers and contributors along with Docker themselves started working on CRI Docker D and it was released uh, in, in between. So then Docker shim support was um, officially removed from the kubelet in version 1.24 of the Kubernetes engine. So you see that all in the release notes. So after that, you will need to either use the supported runtime such as container D directly, or use CRI Docker D if you're relying on the Docker engine for the container runtime. And then fast forward huge versions now to 1.27, it's been running happily uh, with both the CRI Docker D and um, with the engine itself, depending on how the architecture is for various users. So we zoom in a little bit more into the picture. <clears throat> in version one of Kubernetes, and originally, the Docker engine was integrated directly into the kubelet code. So the kubelet will interface with the containers via the Docker engine. 
And as mentioned earlier, to, to provide the capability to interact with a wider range of container runtimes and not just the Docker supported ones, the container runtime interface was introduced. So the CRI acts as an abstraction that standardizes the way different container runtimes interact with Kubernetes, uh, specifically how those runtimes interact with another node component called the kubelet, right? So our kubelet in here and within Kubernetes. So this abstraction layer makes it easier to integrate different runtimes with Kubernetes, or if you wanted to also develop new runtimes, and it kind of brings greater flexibility. So what the kubelet does is it communicates with the CRI shim um, for the runtime over unit sockets using the gRPC framework, which is a Google created RPC framework. Whereas the kubelet acts as a client and the CRI shim acts as a server in the communication there. So the CRI shim, or in our case, um, when we're using Docker, the Docker shim will receive the protobuf, uh, the protobuf sorry, sent from the kubelet to perform various actions such as your run, stop, list, remove, or start, and et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested also in, in finding out more about the gRPC um, framework and how its usages within Kubernetes, uh, we have a Mirantis Lab tech talk called Introduction to gRPC and how to use it in Kubernetes on the Marantis YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out. So once this Kubernetes system has moved to use the CRI abstraction layer, there was a slight complication. Because the Docker engine predated the CRI, and, and, or even Kubernetes for that matter. So of course, it won't conform to the CRI standards. So in order to solve that problem, the project added a new component called the Docker Shim, or, or this component over here, that would act as an adapter between the CRI and the Docker engine. The issue with this, though, is that Docker Shim was never meant to be a permanent solution. It was a stopgap solution to make sure that the Docker engine, or the kubelet, right, I, I should say, actually worked with the Docker engine and container D underneath that, and then communicates to container after that. So as a result, uh, because it wasn't fully planned out, so to speak, a lot of unnecessary complexity has been introduced and some integrations are also inconsistently implemented. So that's kind of led to why uh, the depreciation or the announcement of depreciation prior to version 1.2 Kubernetes and then the depreciation of 1.2 and then the final removal within 1.24. So for those users that kind of needed the entire car or that needed um, the whole Docker engine, CRI Docker D was created. And this is kind of our topic of what we want to talk about today. Now, CRI Docker D is an open source adapter that fully provides or provides fully the CRI conformant compatibility within the Docker engine and the Kubernetes system. It's maintained externally from the Kubernetes project. So it's no longer part of the Kubernetes project. Um, it, as a, um, a joint effort by Mirantis, Docker, and like I mentioned, the open source community. It's also used within Docker Desktop and the Mirantis Kubernetes engine, as well as within the Mirantis container runtime. So the, the CRI Docker D adapter is a stable, narrowly scoped, and reliably maintained project to replace the stopgap solution of Docker Shim. So because it's on its own maintained project, there is, you know, you go through the we could actually focus our efforts on making sure that everything is conforming, everything is planned out well uh, with new features, any additions, bug fixes, and so on and so forth. So CRI Docker D is an adapter that lets Kubernetes use Docker as its container runtime, right? So acting as the bridge and leverages the full suite of Docker functionality. And then again, if we zoom in a little bit more into how that uh, works underneath the hoods and like in the previous, um, diagram, when the kubelet needs to run a pod, or, or it communicates with CRI Docker D, which then translates the CRI commands into Docker commands to be used by the Docker engine or the Mantis uh, container runtime. It's actually MCR, as opposed to MSR. So that allows Kubernetes to interact with Docker just like it would any other CRI compatible runtime. Now. <clears throat> Of course, you might be thinking, do I, um, is this relevant to me? Am I using this? Am I not using this? Of course, that'll depend on the version of Kubernetes that you're running. 
Um, I did a bit of research and it sounds, seems like a lot of the folks are using um, older versions of Kubernetes still. Some are still on version 1.2 or before, uh, even version 1.1 and so on and so forth. Or some of you may be on the later versions or even using Mantis Kubernetes Engine if, um, if you're uh, a partner of ours. So to find out, it's actually pretty straightforward. If you go into your cluster and using kubectl, you could check your container runtime using the uh, kubectl get nodes command. I've got an alias set up, so it's k0. But um, So if you do a get nodes um, and then do an output wide, it'll give you the information for your container runtime. So if you look at the far right uh, of your output here, your container runtime will tell you exactly what type of runtime it's using. Right, so if you're not using the Docker engine, it'll say container D um, set up. Now, if you're using Lens to interact with your clusters, you could also find that same information by looking at the nodes there. So if you go into your cluster, look at your nodes, um, your individual nodes, and then if you scroll down on the node details, you will see your container runtime. In this case, this is using Docker and Demarantis um, container runtime. So if you're using this, then most likely you would either already have CRI Docker D implemented because of um, the uh, Kubernetes engine, or you will need to make sure that if you upgrade to a, a later version of Kubernetes, you will need to have CRI Docker D running. So now if, let's have a look at the use cases. Right? Why do I want to use CRI Docker D? What's the use case for having the entire car? So by design, the container D and alternative runtimes aren't really end user facing, right? So it's meant to be just the engine. You won't interface directly with an engine. You use your car to interface with your engine, right? You're dashboarding with your engine. You've got all the wiring set up. You've got the transmission going to your wheels so that you could actually make the car move. So as a result, <clears throat> things like container D and alternative runtimes, they kind of lack some of the commands and functionalities of Docker engine. So such as the ability to use the Docker commands, your, your um, Docker PS to look at the list of running containers, uh, looking at your container ID, your image use commands, and so on and so forth, or even like port information. So if you need to drill down into your um, containers within the pods, sometimes you may need to actually go into the node and look directly into it. And having this then gives you the ability to look right into the, um, the containers. Now, you could also use things such as Docker Inspect, which is used to get detailed information on your objects right, and in JSON format. So if you want to extract specific configurations like IP addresses, volumes, and port bindings, sometimes you may need to go into that because you know, your container may be um, a bit iffy in the pods. And also things such as Docker Exec. So this is useful if you need to enter a container to debug issues. Now, of course, if you're using Lens, we actually have all that built in, so it makes it a lot easier. Now, in some cases, you may need to run scripts based on commands that are specific to the Docker engine. So, for example, some CI CD pipelines are written in a way that they directly interact with the Docker CLI for building images, running containers, or testing, and so on. So, your build node may be part of your worker node within your Kubernetes cluster as well. So, having the, um, the Docker specific commands or even things such as Docker Compose within the nodes is actually going to make it a lot easier. Uh, for you to manage everything within the one spot. Okay, so if you if you have scripts that are already pre-built that use your Docker specific commands, it may not exist in other alternative runtimes. So that's why you need to use that within your environment. Um, now the third use case could be you may need to run it for whatever reason in privileged pods. And then this could be this will be a very 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 focused and tightly controlled set of pods. But some Kubernetes applications require running privileged privilege containers to operate correctly, you know, often to allow the container direct access to certain system resources, for example, uh, network plugins that may need to manipulate network interfaces and settings on host. So with Docker, you could do that using Docker run um, dash dash privileged uh, and, and may not be uh, supported by alternative runtimes. And so again, creating compatibility issues. Or if we look at a more concrete case, you know, running GPU-enabled containers within the Kubernetes cluster and accessing GPU directly from the container would actually require that. 
So you can't just access the GPUs of your nodes when you're running it on a container. Um, for that, you'll need to set up a unique deployment with elevated privileges. So um, for example, the NVIDIA device plugin for Kubernetes kind of requires running a privileged pod when a compatibility for the CPU manager static policy is needed. So these are things that it depends on the use case, obviously, because running in privileged mode does mean that you do have uh, to control your pods and your nodes a bit more stringently. But there may be use cases where you actually do need to use that. So running that um, is going to you know, support um, privileged modes. And then last but not least, utilizing Docker-specific logging and monitoring. So I mean, the, the engine itself has built-in logging mechanisms that are accessible using the Docker logs command. And this, of course, would be very valuable for debugging and monitoring purposes, which can then provide further insights into the containers. So if you switch to an alternative runtime, you may lose these logging and monitoring capabilities or have to reconfigure them to work with a new runtime. So a lot of these really, if you think about this, if you're, if you're upgrading from a previous version and, and your uh, workflows are pretty um, Docker-centric or, or reliant, you want to make sure that you know when you're going upgrading, when you're moving things around, you're not you're not being affected. I have to refactor everything from scratch when you're going through these. So because these features have been historically available, uh, a lot of folks have made use of them and want to continue using so. Right. So um, really depends on your cluster configuration, workloads, and your specific needs on whether that's relevant to you or not. So these are, of course, things to look out for. Um, when you're designing your clusters. Now, of course, with the Maranthus container runtime, you don't really have to think too much about it because within the Maranthus container runtime, it's all built in, right? So the Maranthus container runtime is an enterprise grade uh, hardened version of the Docker engine. And it already has components such as your CRI Docker D built in, it does have your container D engine and run C that actually allows you to interface directly with the containers. And it also has additional functionality such as your build kit um, to build your containers. Um, you have your orchestration built into the container runtime through Swarm and also networking volumes are really built in. And on top of that, it, it is created using FIPS 140-2 validated um, cryptography so that it will not get in the way of you trying to achieve your own FIPS validation and also for security compliance within your um, environments. So it, it's built on open standards. Um, we do also within Marantis um, have a number of the maintainers within the upsource uh, upstream Docker engine. So anything that we find, obviously that gets built into upstream and then flows into the product as well through a very stringent um, testing of various operating systems, various environments, and various scenarios. Now you have the runtime there. And as we were saying before, when you're doing your Kubernetes installations, you have to think about, okay, what runtime am I using? Do I need to connect? Do I need to set up um, CR, Docker D, tweak things within my Kubernetes clusters or not? Now with the current Marantis Kubernetes engine, everything again comes out of the box. Right, so within the Marantis Kubernetes engine, you have the Marantis container runtime already in there. So you've got all the functionality of the Marantis container runtime with CRI, uh, Docker D, with container D within, and FIPS 140 2 validation. But also has all of the other functionalities that you need with a Kubernetes distribution. Because if you've all, always, uh, if anybody's tried to spin up their own Kubernetes uh, cluster, you know that Kubernetes doesn't come alone, right? You would need a lot of other things to create a complete secure solution. You have your orchestration through Kubernetes, but on top of that, you would need storage. You need security, networking and monitoring. These all require additional knowledge and adds to complexity of running your own Kubernetes environment. So the Marantis Kubernetes engine comes with all of these out of the box. You have your ingress controller through Nginx. We already have a GPU and NVIDIA plugin. You've got your networking through Calico, or if you like to, if you already have your own networking interface, you can actually connect it up as well. So it's batteries included, but also swappable. We have all of the um, drivers needed. We've got um, things such as signing, um, 
cluster management dashboards, automated upgrades, role-based access control, everything out of the box so that um, when you, you want to spin up your own Kubernetes clusters, all you need is to run the installation and you're ready to start running. So in summary, why CRI Docker D? Now CRI Docker D again allows for the bridge of, um, first of all, allowing you to utilize your Docker workflows that you've been utilizing up until this point within your Kubernetes clusters, giving you the full power of everything within. Um, within Con Mantis Container Runtime, that is all built in, uh, along with enterprise level hardening with FIPS 140 2 validation, uh, image signing with Swarm capability of simple orchestration if you need to. And it also has the supported CRI into Kubernetes because CRI Docker D is already built in. So it's a simple configuration change within your Kubernetes cluster to get up and running right away. And it's fully supported on both Linux, um, secured Red Hat, Windows environments. And with the Kubernetes engine, you don't even need to do the configuration. Everything is already built in. So the Mantis Kubernetes engine helps with the management of the platform, but also the deployed resources through a central user interface. So with the CRI Docker D, you have um, the focused and managed uh, uh, bridge between your Kubernetes cluster and your runtime. With the Mantis Kubernetes engine, everything is built in. So you have all of the benefits of those along with your cluster management dashboard, your lifecycle management of a container cluster, deploys both Kubernetes and Swarm, and runs both Windows and Linux containers. But Kubernetes is a first-class citizen in everything here we make, and it's an upstream Kubernetes distribution. So it is CNCF certified, so that your workloads between migration between your Kubernetes clusters is a simple, well, literally just move your workloads throughout. Right? So there's nothing um, that you need to customize in order to utilize this. That's, yeah. Batteries all included with a pluggable ecosystem with your ingress controller, your CNI, your storage interface, and with built-in role-based access control, your security is now a lot easier. It's just a matter of making sure that your security profiles are being set and you don't have to do the implementation of it. So with that, um, but for, for, for more information, you know, uh, please visit us at marastas.com. Uh, the CRI Docker D project is also on GitHub. It's under Mirantis slash CRI Docker D if you'd like to find out more information on that and implementation. So all that information is there. There's also um, more information within Mirantis blogs to look at the actual implementation of CRI Docker D, how to hook that up with your Kubernetes clusters and uh, an FAQ section if you need as well. So with that, um, uh, we'll conclude the webinar. Um, hope you all have a rest, uh, good rest of your day and hope to see you soon in a subsequent webinar.